welcome to the CLA's ESG Sections YouTube recording, where we're speaking with Lisa LaPlante, who is a professor at, on the East Coast and is a expert on operational level grievance mechanisms to address human rights and environmental issues in multinational supply chains. So thanks, uh, Professor LaPlante, for having us on. As you might have been able to mention, I forgot exactly which university you're affiliated with. I'm not sure if it's Harvard. Yeah, or no Rutgers problem. Or... <laughs> it's, yeah, it's nice to be here. I teach at New England Law School, where I not only professor of a law, but also direct the Center for International Law and Policy. Mm -hmm. so, so in the context of your work with the International Law and Policy Center, you, your your academic efforts focus on operational level grievance mechanisms, right? Maybe yes. you could tell us a bit. First, let's tell us a bit about yourself, and then you could tell our audience a bit about what OGMs are. But first, Absolutely. I'd love to learn a bit more about yourself, where you come, where you come from, doing this work, and how you've begun doing it. Now. Yeah, sure. Uh, so uh, I have been an academic for about fifteen years, and before that, I was doing human rights work mostly in Latin America. My background uh, has been uh, two fields, transitional justice and really a focus on reparations and then business and human rights. And so where I see the commonality, the bridge is the right to remedy. So both fields are engaged with that discussion. And, and so a lot of my work has been focused on what it looks like to assure an adequate and effective remedy for people who have suffered human rights harms. Uh, and at the same time, I am very much a part of the business and human rights community. I teach business and human rights at uh, the law school. And we also, through the center, have a, a project that we began in 2016 tracking and mapping operational level grievance mechanisms. The project has grown quite a bit in the last few years, and, and we've been able to make significant strides in not only uh, expanding our research tools, but also our database. And, and so we're really excited to be able to start sharing some of the results of that research and also some exciting collaborations to expand our understanding of operational level grievance mechanisms. Yeah, it's really great to have you on today because you re you really are an authority on this topic, this this really very interesting and important topic. I often will find you at the end of a kind of research, a footnote portal, if you will, <laughs> where it'll, it'll go back to a lot of your work and the work that you're doing to track these OGMs. I, I might call them o operational level, OLGMs or either way. Let's just take two beats back, though, to get back to... Um, the thing you were talking about at the very beginning, which was um, transitional justice, is that is the idea of transitional justice, and we don't have to go too deep into it, but it's an interesting topic. It is my understanding that it's transitions from different forms of governments where there might be reparations for past human rights abuses, like say Pinochet's regime or something like that. Yeah. So as a field, transitional justice is very, very broad, <laughs> but it generally encompasses processes in countries that are transitioning from war, apartheid, um, civil strife, and dictatorships. And they are referring to the different mechanisms that are resorted to, to assure accountability and redress. And so one of those mechanisms are administrative reparation programs that seek to offer uh, repair for often hundreds, if not thousands of people. Mm -hmm. And there's many tensions and challenges in, in the operation of those types of administrative reparation uh, programs. And so a lot of my research and writing has actually been on that subject. Yeah. So like truth and reconciliation commissions, for instance, and it's difficult because how do you write the unwritable, as it were? How, how do you, you know, remediate something that you really can't remediate, but it's and on yeah. a mass scale. Yeah, and, and so that's why the topic of remedies is so fascinating because it's not a traditional, if you will, transactional type of calculation that you get in traditional private uh, litigation. So torts, which results in some kind of damages award, which often is just money and looking at the receipts and the doctor bills and coming up with a set amount. Uh, there are some challenges because one, how do you actually come up with a, a fair way of repairing horrendous wrongs, which are often caused 
by the state itself or, or groups within the country. And so these plans often have to elaborate and find a lot of other ways to approximate uh, the full recovery, not the full recovery, but the full recognition and repair to the extent possible uh, for all these people, but also face the challenges of short budget, budgets, competition for other needs, such as building the economy. And so there's often compromises that uh, arise when trying to implement these types of reparation plans. And, and you can see you can see it in some countries that have had difficult political moments that haven't had a full accounting of various abuses by the government. They don't necessarily they don't all move on in the same way. I mean, it might be might be simplistic to make an analogy to humans who have trauma. And if you don't address your trauma, you often can't move past your trauma. And you can see that even in countrywide issues. So that's political uh, accounting and reparations. And then in the business and human rights context for our audience that might not be as familiar, the idea of remedy comes up in the business and human rights context in supply chains or other business relationships where companies may have caused or contributed or been involved in some type of human rights or environmental issue, and they need to account for and remedy that. Could you, is that about right? Is there something you'd like to elaborate on? Yes, absolutely. So there's a couple of ways to to explain that. You did a great job, but just to point to the fact that the United Nations guiding principles also reflect that understanding of the responsibility of companies to contribute to or, or cooperate in remedy, remedying any type of negative human rights harm uh, that they may uh, either directly cause or contributed to and the expectation is um, that that would occur through what would be best described as kind of an ecosystem of remedies. So the more traditional approach is go to the courts, but obviously that is costly and burdensome even to companies. And so there are a lot of uh, non-judicial approaches, either state level or even non-state level private remedies. And so these this idea of an operational level grievance mechanism, which shows up in UNGP principle 29, can best be described as the types of uh, complaint mechanisms within companies that are set up to actually receive these types of complaints from employees or members of the community to resolve these types of disputes. And that, that's a point that I, I wanted to hit on as well. When, I, when I'm speaking to companies in the context of the model contract clause projects that we're that I'm involved with, or just in general, how updating supply contracts to implement UN guiding principles um, issues. We have a section on operational level grievance mechanism, and in the context of when, for the company's perspective, often I'm fo more focused on the reporting aspect of OGMs because it, it allows for human rights due diligence. Uh, and discovery of human rights or environmental issues from the stakeholders themselves, from the victims, it, if it's if it's structured properly, um, if it has the uh, appropriate anonymity, the appropriate kind of access, all of those things, it allows you to it allows another way of feedback for for companies. Absolutely. And, and this, in fact, is a theme that I recently contributed to the ABA practitioner's guide on due diligence, actually looking at the role of OGMs. And in fact, if you if you take a look at the UNGPs, that's actually one of the um, purposes of OGMs that um, was envisioned that it would be a way to provide ongoing feedback to a company to allow them to identify risks, especially before they escalate into larger project uh, problems rather and, um, you know, what's interesting, though, is the research revealed that very few companies articulate that connection. It may be that by default, the OGMs are being used to provide that type of information and, and help with their ongoing due diligence, which is a requirement within the um, the know and show requirement of, you know, keep on top of any of your risks and do your best to prevent it. So OGMs are key to actually preventing 
serious human rights harms. But uh, what I've observed is they've come to be associated much more with the remedy aspect, which is a part of what uh, they are envisioned to handle claim, not claims, but disputes or complaints rather, uh, mm. and to try to resolve those. But a lot of my work is focusing on, I don't think they were actually intended to handle the most serious types of claims, but that seems to be the movement in the field to create them almost as a quasi-judicial mechanism for resolving pretty serious human rights claims. Could you tell us a bit more about these? Uh, so... so I understand you're you're you you're about to publish an article in the Harvard International Law Journal, which is really fantastic. And I'd love to hear a bit about that work. And I think you're leading into that with that last point. But just to ensure that you discuss what what you were just talking about, which is the increasing use of OGMs by companies to address address harms, and then. And then I, I've I've been lucky enough to read a draft of your, of your article, so I know where you're going to go. But how you feel uh, governments need to ensure accountability and neutrality in those OGMs? But yeah, first, sure. Um, a bit more about the type of OGMs that are being established. Yeah, absolutely. So the the article uh, is due to come out in a few weeks in the Harvard Journal of International Law. I'm very thrilled to have that um, be debuted. It's a project I've been working on for quite a while now, and it is also uh, sharing some of the research from the operational level grievance mechanism research project uh, that I run through the the center at New England Law School. And so, just as a quick number crunching at this point. As of December 2022, uh, because our trend reports come out usually the end of the, the term in the summer uh, and, and capture all the data up until that point, we had 559 companies across 24 industries. Uh, about 88% of those are multinational companies. Uh, and we have a, a wide range of industries uh, that we are, are looking at. Uh, significantly, based on the criteria that we use, we did find 91% of those companies have some kind of mechanism which arguably is set up or, or at least open to claims that could, uh, could implicate human rights. So one of the things to clarify that in, in identifying those OGMs, which is not easy, uh, we, it's all desktop research and we're looking at the documents that the company share either right there on a web page or in their annual reports. And so digging through all of this information, we have a criteria of looking at how they actually call their OGMs. Very few of them have human rights in the title, but they may refer to their human rights policy, which of course is one of the uh, requirements of the UNGPs, or they may reference a code of conduct or an ethics code, which has human rights in it. So we find different ways of showing that a, that a grievance mechanism in theory would be open to receiving human rights complaints. Now, what is uh, equally interesting and remarkable is uh, what kind of mechanisms these are in practice, at least based on the desktop research and, and what companies are choosing to share. So we don't have the capacity to do an actual rating or evaluation. We don't talk to any of the companies yet, uh, but we do look at a, a baseline criteria and come up with a ranking of sort, looking at the most developed, well-developed baseline as our ways, a way of identifying uh, where the OGM could be situated. Now, to get most advanced, uh, you, you, uh, a company would have some kind of indication that they engage in dialogue or alternative dispute resolution, that they provide some kind of robust process for those who are engaging with the mechanism and, and that it's open to, to all people, so employees and, and those in the community. A well-developed is almost that, except for it doesn't have that robust process. In a baseline is some kind of way of receiving a complaint, which tends to be hotlines, yeah. which is a whole new side uh, side gig, if you will, of this industry of a lot of different ways in which there's a third party that is a hotline and receives a complaint. And it's not always clear what the procedure is or um, how it's actually uh, 
carried out. So what's amazing is that of all these companies, the most advanced, only 1% of the companies have evidence of this robust process. And the majority have the baseline OGM. Uh, so there's, you know, there's some takeaways from this. One, it may be just a question of transparency, which is also required by UNGP 31 in the in the sense that if I and my my team of researchers, students who are, you know, law students cannot find these mechanisms, I, I highly doubt that a community a member or an employee could probably find these mechanisms. It could be that they're not sharing the information. All of that is very, very, very plausible. Uh, but based just plainly on what is uh, available, it does seem that while companies are moving towards creating these mechanisms, there's still quite a lot of work to be done uh, to assure that they they are good mechanisms. And, and, and moreover, very few companies report the outcomes of these processes. So publish how many complaints they receive and, and the outcome of whether they're actually delivering reparations. So that's the, the background on the state of the world of OGMs. So that, that's the that's the long term research project you've been involved in, which is is cataloging, if you will, the, the various it, it it sounds it sounds like the know your chain report. Are you familiar with that? Yeah. Yeah. Just... And, and we have a we have a, a pretty detailed, extensive log of questions that we're, you know, we're putting them all in a database and. We, we, again, issue a trends report where we're trying to offer a, a meta-analysis of the state of affairs uh, based on what we've observed. And so that's your ongoing research project. And then the article that you're having published in the Harvard Journal um, kind of delves into deeper into process issues and speaks specifically to neutral parties. And I'll let you describe it rather than yeah, me. Sure, no problem. So uh, this article, which is, uh, as you mentioned, uh, due to be published shortly and, um, you know, it has a, a provocative uh thesis, which is often the case with law professors, the wild west of company level grievance mechanisms, drawing normative borders to patrol the privatization of human rights remedies. And really the, the base, basic thesis of this article is one, that there is definitely a trend towards establishing these mechanisms based on not only my project, but that of some other groups that they are being used or at least poised to be used to resolve human rights claims, sometimes very serious human rights claims, but they are doing so without any type of accountability. And when, as a human I rights lawyer- Accountability as in- um, Accountability stakeholder for group. The, yeah, because I, yeah. I could imagine that stakeholder groups could- give a bit of pushback if the stakeholders are represented by, say, Earth Rights or one of these advocacy groups. But in the absence of that, I would imagine. Yeah, I mean, there are uh, certainly uh, Accountability Council, which does amazing work with um, grievance processes, but these are with the international uh, mechanisms. So the World Bank and the OECD, these are different kinds of mechanisms. And there may be some NGOs that are aware of some of these OGMs, but there are not a lot, right? Mm -hmm. Given the numbers that we have found, we often do a search as well to see if NGOs are engaging with these mechanisms to get additional information about them. And there's just not a lot of attention or, or even scrutiny of these grievance mechanisms. On the, on the contrary, what I argue in the piece is that they're actually applauded and celebrated and promoted, and there's many pressures on companies to establish these OGMs. So I, I kind of run through the, the laundry list, but they're often a result of a settlement. So the OECD national action, um, the points may ask a company to establish an OGM or, or a voluntary code may require it or a business association may require it and and now with the german due diligence law they may actually legally be uh, asked to, to establish an ogm so there's a lot of pressure 
on companies to establish these mechanisms, not just the social pressure from the UNGPs and the, and the knowledge of them. But there's no state oversight. There's no assurance that the process actually, that, that those who engage with the process are protected or that the outcome is fair or can be actually challenged. In, in theory, a person can always just bring their claim to a court in this, in fact, was the whole issue that came up with um, Barrett Gold in, in terms of their waiver, which would be equivalent to a settlement where if there was reparations paid. And, and, that, and just, that just to backtrack case, for a second, so, so just give a very short background on Barrett Gold. They're a mining company in Papua New Guinea. Yeah, and so they established um, around 2012, uh, I believe it was, a, a uh, operational level grievance mechanism to handle claims of sexual um, uh, violations, rape by the security guards of the mine, and they established the OGM. And and, and this with, covered you, this, this abuse covered like decades and was hundreds of claimants, right? Yeah, and and I mean, I think they had good intentions of trying to resolve these through a remedy, but it it really backfired and got a lot of negative attention and. And some of the women refused to engage and were represented in the U.S. and and got a higher claim, a reparation outcome, and and then they had to equal um, the the compensation to those women who had engaged in it. But one of the real lightning rods of the case was this waiver and the UN um, Office of the it High was, Commissioner. It was the, if, if I'm not wrong, it was the idea that uh, claimants who were have their claims resolved and receive payments through the grievance mechanism would waive their ability to bring litigation in, in other courts or receive Yeah, and, and which would be the case if you settled in, in a court, right? That often yeah. settlement requires non-disclosure. And, uh, yeah. But this was challenged and, and actually um, eventually, you know, I think that with the involvement of the UN, which said they're not prohibited, but they really should not be used except for in very careful, uh, in a very careful manner. And so aside from that, what, I, what I'm arguing is that there's just not a lot of regulation of these OGMs. And there's almost a sense that that's okay. You know, we're happy that companies are trying to resolve these issues. What I find to be um, remarkable about the situation is that based on my work, especially as a, you know, a remedies practitioner and scholar, that the crux of assuring human rights protection is assuring that a remedy is adequate and effective, not only for compensating those who suffer harms, but to hold companies accountable, right? So it serves that dual purpose. And so it's it's somewhat ironic uh, that we're in a world in which there, there are these private remedies leaving us pretty much in, in the state of affairs pre-UNGPs of um, self-regulation. And so what the article does is present a normative framework for why it is that states actually should and, and actually are under an international obligation to be paying better attention to these OGMs. And, and part of that is challenging um, uh, the opinion that was issued by the, um, the UN Office of the High Commissioner equating OGMs in, in the context in which they operate to transitional justice remedies programs. So my first line of uh, discussion is looking at the many ways in which those domestic reparation programs are very much scrutinized, especially by uh, international courts, in particular the Inter-American Court of Human Rights, and that there is, in fact, a very clear legal framework for assuring that those uh, programs don't just do whatever they want. Uh, and so there is some kind of criteria for evaluating these non-judicial mechanisms. And then the second um, part of my normative argument is looking at human rights law, which creates a dual level obligation, um, which by the way is also in the UNGPs, which is first that the primary obligation of assuring a remedy falls on the state, right? So that's human rights treaties, that's human rights law, that the yeah. state ultimately is, is obligated to not only prevent harms, but to assure a remedy when um, harms have been violated, not just by state agents, but by non-state agents as well. And that in uh, failing to actually 
uh, provide that remedy, states are on the hook for yet a second human rights violation because that right to a remedy is itself a human rights, a, a human right, right? So hmm. what that means is a state uh, is not able to delegate nor say it's no longer responsible for assuring this remedy because of a, a private OGM, but in fact is still obligated to assure that remedy and therefore should be uh, providing some kind of oversight for these remedies. Mm -hmm. And that's a not so short uh, <laughs> the synthesis of the main argument. It's a pretty long article, so. No, yeah, no, it's an interesting article. And, and that was relatively concise, all things considered. 50 pages and 200 footnotes, you summarized it pretty well. <laughs> a couple of points so you mentioned national contact points would you so could you explain a little bit about how national the national contact point system works and do you see national contact points being uh useful in helping to um maybe not govern provide oversight to these ogms yeah. So the article uh, had a last section on all of this. And then I realized that's article two, <laughs> because the first one was already too long. But, uh, you know, I left it. For, for, any... for, for our audience, let's explain what national contact points are. <laughs> yeah, absolutely. So um, the OECD, which is a, um, you know, treaty based member state international, you know, institution has within it uh, obligations to regulate businesses. And one of its mechanisms or one of the requirements is that states set up national contact points to assure that they're in fact offering uh, the, not only the, that they're regulating companies, but that those impacted by companies have some kind of recourse to present their complaints. And, and it's a whole nother level of remedy and um, IAMs, independent accountability mechanisms is a whole nother field, which I know of, but it's not what we're looking at. Mm -hmm. So, you know, the, the I end the article proposing that we need to figure this out. Um, and there's a paradox to the conclusion that I reach, which is, although I'm arguing that OGMs should not be used for serious human rights claims, and in fact, really should go back to their original purpose of detecting early on, as a part of a due diligence process, um, those issues that are risks that the company can handle before they escalate. But I also acknowledge that often we're in settings or contexts where victims have no other recourse. And it may be that a company OGM is all that they have to get some kind of response to the harm that they've faced. And, and I have to live with that reality. And so what I propose is that, okay, if we, if we are going to accept that OGMs will exist to handle these more serious claims, we need to assure some kind of oversight. The question is which government, right? So if the same government in which this OGM is operating is clearly not able to offer the judicial remedy because presumably the, the victims would go to that recourse if it were available, then maybe it's asking too much to ask that government to regulate OGMs, at least with not with, without some help. So it could be that it would be a collaboration with other governments. Perhaps the IAMs would serve some kind of check on OGMs. It could be that maybe they're set up to evaluate uh, the mechanism and the process, although I'm not sure it's clearly been uh, resolved whether uh, exhaustion of domestic remedies, uh, whether an OGM counts as much or even precludes uh, being able to access an IAM. Sometimes in international systems, if you've already tried one form, you're excluded from another. These are legal questions that I haven't yet seen uh, be addressed or resolved. So there's a lot of possibilities. Maybe multi-stakeholder uh, initiatives could be a check on OGMs, or there could be, you know, kind of a, a OGM that serves multiple companies is then run by a third party. There may be different configurations, and and I have preliminary thoughts on those arrangements without a definite conclusion on what makes the most sense. Yeah. So in in the context of what I do often on on my it, during. Uh my day-to-day -day activities and what I did done for a large portion of my career uh, in international arbitration, international commercial arbitration, we're used to the two sides uh, 
having a private dispute resolution system that's administered by um, an arbitral institution that has a set of rules and procedures for resolving this dispute formally. And then I've got a list of arbitrators that specialize in the type of dis the issues that are going to be salient for the dispute. And, but the difference is, of course, the parties in an international commercial dispute are often on relatively similar economic sophistication footing. Um, and that's why I've often, I've often talked about uh, uh, arbitration in the context of consumer arbitration or employee arbitration as being not as appropriate because of the relative disparity in resources between, say, an employee and an employer or a consumer and, you know, a large, a large company. But in the context of international commercial arbitration, it, it hasn't been problematic. In the context of something like stakeholder grievances, you you once again run into power imbalances and that's almost the nature of the issue the the harms occurring in large part because of the power imbalance so it's difficult in a private dispute resolution forum or context how do you ensure that both parties have have a normative framework that ensures equity yeah, and I, I think that's exactly why we should worry about these mechanisms, right? Because of that very reason that uh, that power imbalance and that alone makes it harder to guarantee a fair outcome. And, you know, without getting into it too much, um, whether arbitration is even appropriate for the most serious human rights claims. Certainly in the US, uh, the US Congress has decided that sexual harassment claims are not subject to arbitration. And, and I would say that's, you know, you could impose a human rights understanding of that limitation. Uh, so that aside, I think that's, that's the crux of the issue, right? That you have largely disempowered communities and employees, uh, unless there's a union, which is a whole other side topic. Um, but I'm looking, I'm thinking about those who don't have the power of their representation. Maybe they can afford a lawyer, uh, usually pretty doubtful. And maybe the process doesn't even let them have a lawyer. We don't know. That's the whole issue that this is not a transparent process. And yet it's, it's being set up um, to handle these kind of claims, but even more so, and, and what I would argue, and I've argued elsewhere, is that there is something to be said for the process itself being reparative, how a company engages with those who have been aggrieved is in itself a form of reparation if done properly. And in fact, if not done properly, will undermine the outcome, even if there's an outcome that objectively looks good, right? So the, the parties, the agreed parties receive money and they're still really angry and they may, you know, if it's a community, challenge the company, interrupt the company's operations. And, and it's because the process is not done well. And so part of my work is also looking at what is what it entails to conduct a process that is dignifying and and treats these uh, individuals with a level of respect and entails facilitation and, and even dispute resolution, maybe by a third party, is actually going to be a part of the repair that's needed because it is in fact the lack of that, which often creates the grievances to begin with. And that is why when we look at the most advanced companies and the processes that they offer, in my opinion, is hugely significant because if they're just saying, call us and we'll give you money, it's not going to resolve the issue. Hmm. And in fact, it may even make people angrier because they'll feel that they're being paid off not to complain and nothing changes. Mm -hmm. That That's that. And yeah, I think you mentioned it earlier that part of the purpose of OGMs is, is to restore justice, but it's also to to punish or disincentivize uh, companies from contributing to, to further problems. And so if part of its function is to punish, it's not often that you have the, you know, it's like telling your kid, to, how much do you want me to ground you? You know, you usually don't have the person <laughs> who's being punished. A very, a very oh. precocious and advanced child may be able to participate in that negotiation. And, and again, it's not punishment. There's a distinction between accountability and punishment. And in fact, 
in tort law, you know, punitive damages are pretty rare for companies. Mm. And, and that elsewhere, I've argued that even without punitive damages, having to still pay something is a form of accountability because it's a price uh, that companies pay. Now, we could get into a whole nother discussion on whether they just write that off and whether it actually makes a difference. All of that is fine. But there is a form of accountability with any remedies. So businesses spend a lot of time and hire a lot of people to avoid litigation. And there's a whole approach to avoiding that type of risk. That is a business risk, future litigation, uh, because it's accountable a form of accountability. Uh, and so the same goes for an OGM, if it is set up to handle these kinds of claims, which go towards saying to the company, your operations are harming people. And so that's where the, the, the sense of accountability comes into play. Now, if OGMs are in place to assist with the due diligence process, there's less of an emphasis perhaps on that idea of as you say, punishing or holding them accountable, it's it's actually preventive. And it's quite wise, right? Because you're you're using the very users of the product or those directly impacted by their operations to let the company know, you know, this is a problem and your your due diligence process will capture that information and hopefully take measures to mitigate um, or at least prevent hopefully the problem. So, so I'm I I know that you're about to take a week long vacation, which you're very excited for. <laughs> so I want to let you go in just a second. But if I could just ask you one last question, sure. which um I I hope uh, stems from a lot of what what we've been talking about. I want to ask how how you see the future of this area evolving, particularly in the context of what we've been discussing as far as. It it's not best to have ad hoc solutions to these problems. It's probably better to have a uh, formal process in place. It might be helpful to have institutional structures in place that will ensure neutrality. Um, and I, my, I would say that it's ever more important that we aren't reinventing the wheel every single time it, it issue arises because given the recent wave of human rights due diligence legislation, it's it, you would expect that there's going to be a lot more of these OGMs put in place and a lot more um, disputes that need to be resolved. But maybe you could speak to that a bit more um, in the context of the EU, the German law. Yeah, so um, as I I mentioned, and, and it's it's certainly more detailed in, in my article, there are a lot of pressures on companies to do this. Some of it uh, voluntary, but also more and more legal, especially as due diligence laws are starting to require OGM. So the German due diligence law does have that in place. And uniquely, uh, they have an office to receive complaints about OGM. So accountability of OGMs is, is uh, you know, the theme of the day. And that will be really interesting uh, to follow and see how that develops. And so what I imagine is that as these become more required and they become integrated into actual legal frameworks, then there will be more of an opportunity to not only assure that they're uh, they're operating in a manner which is ultimately in the best interest of the users, but also to hopefully begin to glean and collect information on best practices and and how to assure that these mechanisms are working that way. We have some pilot projects trying to look at that, but uh, generally speaking, there's not a lot of information yet on you know, model examples or best practices or even lessons learned. So that's something that we're starting to work on now. And the UN High Commissioner for Human Rights, uh, they have a access to remedy project, I, I'm assuming you're involved with. Um, yeah, Very so useful I have resource. A, uh, yeah, um, so I was uh, I had the opportunity to very much uh, be a part of that process. They were kind enough to invite me, and in fact, they were able to use some of our data, which was always which is always a thrilling uh, opportunity to have our students be able to help with the UN. And generally speaking, they were very receptive to 
you know, the ideas that I'm presenting. I, but if anything, I think during their meetings, I did confirm there wasn't as much attention to the accountability of these mechanisms. I do know that they ultimately did include um, reference to this issue, and, and I acknowledge it in the article, but I think more can be done. Um, you know, I think their reports are a great resource, but the way that they are presented is not necessarily the case studies or the best practices, although my understanding is they have a lot of that and they hope to do new new uh, projects with it. Um, but I do think uh, projects such as the one I mentioned that um, my center is starting to embark on and perhaps others of actually engaging with companies and learning more about it, the companies have to be willing to share what they're doing. That's That's one of the challenges. So companies that are happy to share their experiences and be open to engage engaging with us to figure out how to do this well ultimately for you know the betterment of not only their operations but the people that they impact through their good services and operations so uh that, that's a helpful point to leave and we're right on the dot so thank you very much for taking the time to speak with us today is there anything you wanted to mention before you go yeah, just thank you so much for the opportunity to uh, share this. And, you know, I'm excited to do it on the on the eve of the article coming out. So I do hope people will look for that. And uh, I'm always happy to uh, offer more insight to any uh, companies, especially who are interested in uh, working on this theme. Thank you so much for the opportunity. Have a great day.